Good evening from 42 Bedford Row. Um, I'm Desmond Corcoyne, and um, this evening I'm going to be talking about the new Civil Procedure Rule Part 81 that's been introduced. Um, and I'll do the first half of this talk. Uh, Peter Jolly will then uh, continue on, and Peter's going to talk about perhaps slightly more of the details of the rules. Um, uh, and perhaps the, the more the more technical points that you need to uh, think about when you're making an application under the new rules. Um, this is part of our um, housing group series of webinars, and you can find those on our YouTube 42 Bedford Road channel if you're interested. And we have more of those um, coming through. So to start, um, I'm going to have some slides flashing up. The slides repeat the wording of the rules uh, and will reflect most of what I'm going to say. If you want to follow that along with that as, as I'm going along. So by way of introduction, um, what has what has happened? Uh, there was a part 81 uh, and a practice direction to part 81 dealing with uh, all sorts of contempt of court applications. Um, as you uh, will find out, as from the 1st of October this year, as you probably know already, from the 1st of October this year, that practice, that practice direction has gone in its, entirely, uh, in its entirety and a new rule has been um, brought in. Uh, the statutory instrument is the one shown uh, on the screen, the Civil Procedure Amendment Number 3 rules uh, to, to, to uh, 2020. Um, and as I say, it's a completely substituted, a new substituted rule that we have now. The practice direction has gone. And there are also going to be some new forms. And for that reason, practice direction four, which deals with forms, it has also been updated to remove the old, now to be disused forms and inserting references um, to the new ones. Why do we have a new Part 81. Well, if you ever tried to navigate uh, the, old, the, the old rule as it was, and certainly if you ever had to pick it up in a hurry and look at it, you'd understand that um, it was um, extremely badly laid out. There seemed to be provisions for one type of contempt of court application that were slightly in, inconsistent with other ones, or just, some applications provided for certain matters where the other types of application didn't provide for those. And in general, uh, Part 81 came in for a, a fair degree of criticism. Uh, the president of the Queen's Bench Division described it as being found wanting. That was in the Attorney General case against Mr. Yaxley Lennon in 2019, otherwise known as Mr. Tommy Robinson, at the case where he was um, he, action was taken against him for contempt of court when he was standing outside courts with a megaphone shouting about what was going on inside the courtroom. He, he was sentenced to, he, uh, he was sentenced to prison for um, his behaviour. And during the course of those proceedings, and in particular before the Queen's Bench Division, uh, parts of uh, Part 81 were examined. And as I say, the, the, the rules were regarded as difficult to negotiate. Um, complex, repetitive, unclear, I think, in, in various other cases, as, as it has been described. So it's gone, and that, is, I think, is, is good riddance. Uh, the Civil Procedure Rules Committee um, started looking at change uh, earlier on this year, and the new rule is the result of the consultation that took place. So what do we have now? And I think most practitioners will be fairly, I say they'll be, practitioners will be refreshed. It's very refreshing. Uh, it's a very simple, neat new rule. Uh, the, um, there are 10, 10 parts rather than 30 or in excess of 30 different rules under the previous uh, part 81, the simple 10 rules. And it's a streamlined procedure intended for all contempt applications. Uh, and you don't even need a practice direction. It's that simple. 
Um, to start with, the idea is that the language uh, will be uh, simpler and more streamlined. Just as an example, um, after, no, we don't use the phrase applicants now, it's claimants in the normal way and respondents are defendants. So that's one, one way in which the language has been changed. Um, interestingly, um, there are no transitional provisions. So as at the 1st of October, um, the rules came in and they apply to all applications. That includes applications which had been issued before the 1st of October. So if you uh, have one of those, have or had one of those, you, you did or you are uh, somewhat puzzled as to how these new rules would apply to your application. And I, I had one of these earlier on in the week. And the task was to decide exactly what needed, if anything, to be done to make sure that the application issued before the 1st October remained regular and could be properly heard by the court. Um, I think the general view is that that is you, that, that uh, the new rules do not require the, uh, the issue of a new application. It's a question of whether the spirit of the rules, the requirements of the new rules are have been met and are, will be met within the application that it's already issued. So for my purposes, for example, um, Peter's going to touch on this later, but if you, if you have a chance to look up uh, 81.4 at some point in time, you'll see the long list of requirements that, are, that there are information requirements, lots of information requirements uh, set out um, in um, any application made after the 1st of October. And two of them, just to take the, the, the two that were concerning um, in, in my case. Um, first of all, under um, uh, I, that a defendant has the right to be legally represented. Well, that's the first. That information must be given under any new application to a um, defendant. And secondly, the defendant is entitled to a reasonable opportunity to obtain legal representation and to apply for legal aid. Now, that also is a requirement. And it may be thought, well, that is what always takes place um, in any event before a district judge or a circuit judge when committal applications occurs. The judges do make, make, are very, very keen and always very... Uh, uh, very conscientious about ensuring that these those sorts of issues are well discussed and considered uh, in any committal application. But there it is. Um, it's now a requirement that that information and that those requirements are set out in writing in the committal application. Well, they hadn't been in, in the case that I was dealing with it. And the question was whether we, in our case, satisfy the spirit of that. And the answer was we did, because the judge had previously gone through all these points on a previous occasion and there was sufficient record of that. And in addition to that, Central London County Court, which has been for the last couple of months fielding a lot of committal applications, for reasons I'll come to a little bit later, Central London sent out the notice of the hearing and, and set out a lot of the information so as to comply in the notice of the hearing uh, with, with the, the rules that have been brought in in 81.4. So, um, what are the headlines? I'm not sure this is a headline to, to start with, but I'm going to start with it anyway. Um, I, I, part 81 does, in fact, in a very small marginal way, continue. There is a saving provision which operates for writ, for writs of sequestration, i.e. a writ appointing an enforcement officer to enter the defendant's property. It, that, that it, part 81 does continue where you have that, uh, you're dealing with that situation and no contempt proceedings uh, have been brought. But I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, part 81, as you would expect, I think, from a procedural rule, in, in, the, rule I've, um, in the rule I've set out at the bottom, emphasises that um, it's subject to, and to the extent that it's consistent with the substantive law of contempt of court. In fact, it doesn't change it at all. If there's old case law which discusses the old rules, the authority of those cases perhaps may be doubtful subject to whether they're within the spirit of the new rules, but in particular, the substantive law does not change. So, for example, things like the mens rea that you have to show about knowledge of an injunction, if it's an injunction, you're dealing with knowledge of an injunction and deliberateness of action, which constitutes a breach, all of that, it remains precisely the same. 
So what are the, these, these 10 rules? Um, Peter's going to deal with them, as I say, in more detail, but just to uh, set them up in two, these two next slides. Rule one deals with the scope of uh, the scope of the rule itself. Rule two, to do with interpretation, the wording used within the rule. And as I say, there's a, a streamlined language approach. Rules three and four are important. They're how to make a contempt application, and in particular, those requirements in rule four. Uh, those have all got to be uh, complied with. There are new forms, but um, Peter will talk about that uh, when, when, he come, when we come to his part of the talk. Rule five, service. Obviously, personal. It's going to be usually personal service, unless there's a very good reason for alternative service. But there's a specific rule about that. 81.6 is an interesting one. I'll come back to this. There's cases where no application is made. I'll come back to that. And then the rest of the rules, as you might logically uh, follow through, are directions for hearings, rules about that, rule, rule in 81.8 about the hearing itself, 81.9, powers of courts, not really introducing uh, any powers, I don't think. It's just simply reflecting the powers that already exist. And lastly, 81.10, applications of discharge uh, committal orders. That, that, is the, uh, that is the layout. Um, so I'm going to go back to rule 81.3, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about what the rule says, and then I'm going to talk about it uh, in so far as it's of interest to housing practitioners. Um, Rule 81.3, uh, which is the opening rule about how to make a committal uh, con uh, contempt application, it immediately distinguishes between two types of application. Applications for which you need per the permission of the court, rather like judicial review or an appeal, a permission requirement, and other applications where you don't require permission. Now, um, this is not going to be an extended uh, extended. Uh, disquisition on the law of contempt of court. If you have picked up Arledge and ED and had a look at all the different variety of, uh, of different types of criminal and, and media related contempt of court, that there are quite a few different types. If you're a housing lawyer, you're really going to be more interested in civil contempt, that is contempt arising out of a breach of an undertaking or an injunction. But there, there are a different variety of, uh, there are, is a different variety, uh, a wide variety of uh, contempt applications and to, to some extent they are distinguished that some of these applications will need permission of the court in the main as I'll explain in a moment a civil contempt application probably is unlikely to need permission but the permission rule is there set out on the screen you will need permission if it involves interference with the due administration of justice unless it's, in, unless it's relating directly to an existing high court or county court um, claim you also need permission where there is an allegation of knowingly making a false statement in an affidavit, affirmation or other document verified by a statement of truth or in a disclosure statement. Um, if you do need permission, you have to apply, uh, you have to make an application for permission within the contempt application. And there are requirements also about the judge to whom you apply for permission as opposed to the judge um, to whom the main application goes. I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, they're up on the, um, they're up on, um, the slide there. Um, under 81.378, if, if, if you need to look at that and find out those uh, two rules. In the main, it's where permission is not needed that most practitioners will be looking. Um, and an application uh, does not require a permission if it's made in existing high court or county court proceedings, or alternatively, if it's made in a part A claim to the high court, as long as there is no interference with the administration of justice outside of the existing proceedings and no allegation of a false statement of truth. Perhaps for present purposes, something more interesting. Um, in the high court, a, con a contempt application must be heard by a high court judge and there it is in the rule, in a county court, a contempt application must be heard by a circuit judge. That's 81.32. So how does this affect, how do these new rules affect us um, as um, housing practitioners? Um, the main circumstances in which 
um, we will be going to court on, on committal applications is, is either going to be for breach of an undertaking or injunction which has been uh, obtained with in support of good housing management practices i say that on the broadest in the broadest basis but more particularly in relation to antisocial behavior uh, and in that connection there are really two types of um, contempt application which we would be normally thinking of those would both arise or be in connection with injunctions under the antisocial behavior act of 2014 and as is as as you will know there are in fact two slightly different types of contempt proceeding that that exist the first is where a, a defendant has been arrested if a power of arrest has been attached to an injunction and there is alleged breach of the injunction uh, the police may arrest the defendant and under that jurisdiction the defendant must be brought before the court within 24 hours and the matter must be disposed of in other words there must be a, a, a decision about whether to commit or not and a final decision within 28 days that is the it's a 28 day jurisdiction as an alternative jurisdiction there remains the option at all times whether within the 28 day period or outside the 28 day period of a claimant issuing an application to to, for, to commit the defendant for contempt of court in relation to the alleged breach of the injunction whether or not the person has been arrested so the question is do these these new rules change uh, any of that and i think in, in in practical terms there probably aren't going to be that there isn't probably going to be that much change however i say that i say that slightly more confidently than i might have done about a month ago because 81.32 does say that in the county court um, uh, the contempt application must be heard by a circuit judge and that of course does raise the issue of, of whether the jurisdiction previously enjoyed by district judges to hear committal applications had in fact been removed um, the short answer to this question is no it hasn't and I'll, I'll come to that but if you're interested in the jurisdictional um, conflict it was of course the case that under section 9 when an arrest took place the defendant had to be brought before a judge of the county court that phrase in the 2014 act is not defined but it was generally thought that it included a, a, a district judge a district judge being a judge of the county court uh, further um, in the, within the civil procedural rules themselves and practice direction 2b it will be appreciated that in fact injunctions and committals which are consequent upon injunctions under the 2014 antisocial behavior act can be allocated to district judges so on the one hand there, there was a clear jurisdiction before the introduction of this new rule which clearly permitted uh, uh, district judges to hear committal applications either under the arrest 28 day arrest jurisdiction or indeed more widely whenever there is a formal application or was that removed by is that removed by uh, part 8132 which says all committal applications must now be heard by a, uh, a circuit judge uh, so there's some doubt about that and in fact the rule has been uh, a new rule has been introduced a uh, new statutory instrument to make sure that it's clear and i think that must be based upon the view that in fact it did inadvertently remove the, the district judge's jurisdiction so since last Wednesday, that's the 2nd of December, the Civil Procedure Amendment Number 6 rules of 2020 uh, were laid before Parliament, and they confirm that the district judge is able to deal with a contempt application for breach of the 2014 Act. So there's no question about district judges hearing these um, applications. There, there remains, and it's not answered by this, by the, the new statutory instrument, there remains the issue, well, is the 28 jurisdiction is when the court is proceeding with a, uh, a committal a committal under the 28 day jurisdiction um, is that a contempt application or committal application for the purposes of part part 81 in other words when the, the defendant's been arrested brought in front of the judge and the judge is deciding how quickly to deal with it is the judge say i'll give you seven days you've got to come back seven days time and we'll have the, uh, the committal hearing then, but go and get a solicitor. 
all those sorts of considerations you have when, if a judge is thinking about dealing with the matter quickly, is the nature of that legal situation uh, such that the uh, is the nature such that Part Eighty One must be complied with? Um, and it, it really the answer to that is it, it really isn't clear. Um, to start with. Uh, to start with, if if it is an application, then that means that the the rule eighty one point four, which Peter can talk about, do, does apply, and that means that even even if you can't uh, generate a document or you don't have a document, you've got to make sure that all this information, one way or another, is conveyed within eighty one point four to the defendant, and of course, ideally in a document, so that there is a record that the defendant isn't in any way prejudiced. Uh, prejudiced in the way that the defendant's contempt application is being dealt with. Um, an alternative, as I, I think I referred to uh, initially, an alternative might be to regard um, the Section 9 arrest jurisdiction as, in fact, what is described as a contempt application without an, uh, a contempt hearing, a contempt proceeding without an application, which is forms the basis of one of these 10 rules. Let me just get the heading for you. In 81.6, it's cases where no application is uh, no application is um, is made. Now, what is a what is a contempt proceeding when no application is made? It appears that this is this is intended to intended to be um, for situations where there's a contempt in the face of the court. Now, what is, what's contempt in the face of the court? That's a, sort of a situation where somebody behaves actually in court on the day of a hearing badly in front of a judge and the judge decides to deal with it. Tends to be dealt with summarily on the occasion. Um, if, if anybody's listening uh, who remembers uh, the county, uh, uh, county court, uh, a well-known story of a judge at that court who uh, was hearing evidence from a housing officer who was chewing gum in the court uh, in the face of signs that this particular judge had placed around the court that there was to be no eating in court. And the judge then, in the face of such contempt, held the housing officer in court for several hours until the director of housing had come down to explain to the judge what on earth was going on, and how such behaviour could be, could be um, tolerated. That sort of thing is the a case where perhaps no application will be made. Well, is that, it, it, do, do proceedings under Section 9, 28 day jurisdiction, do they fall within that category? Well, if they do, the court is required under 81.6 actually to issue a document in relation to proceeding to commit the defendant. It's called a summons. The, um, the summons is issued on the defendant and the defendant is given directions for returning to court to answer uh, the, committal, um, the committal claim. And of course, that summons, as it turns out, must set out all the information that's found in eight, Rule 81.4. So it's very similar to an application in the sense that all of the requirements are being satisfied to ensure that the defendant has been given a proper and fair hearing. Well, perhaps these proceedings fall within that category. I, I'm afraid I can't give a, a, a clear answer to that um, today. I think the safest course is that you have to, whichever whichever way you decide to proceed, you have to comply with the spirit of um, 81.4. Uh, and that means that ensuring that the defendant is given proper time to obtain legal representation and there is no real risk or significant risk to their liberty as a consequence of a custodial sentence, as a consequence of um, having been unfairly treated through the court process. If therefore this is not an absolutely urgent case, if there is not a serious risk of some serious further breach of an injunction, um, the wise course is probably to take time to ensure that after the application document or summons is um, properly uh, is properly served on um, the defendant informing of their rights with a view to minimizing the risk of unfairness and the breach of the convention uh, rights. Of course, there will be some cases where um, 
there is a degree of urgency. And in those cases, again, it is the spirit of Section 80 of Rule 81, the new Rule 81, that must be complied with. And you really have to sit down and look at those requirements and make sure that everything is being done, even if the case is being dealt with quickly. Everything is being done to make sure that person's Article 6 rights are being protected. So, having had having discussed Part 81 and potential relevance to um, to uh, the area of antisocial behaviour in, in housing. I'm now going to hand over to Peter to go back to some of the more technical rules. Thanks, Desmond, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Jolly, and I'll be talking you through the second half of today's webinar on Part 81. And um, just before I start, a reminder that we'll be making today's webinar available on our YouTube channel, and also loading the slides that we've had up on screen for you to download later. And the best thing to do is to go onto our website, which is 42br.com, and follow the links. Desmond's been talking to you about the matter of permission, and I'd like to move on next to the subject of the new forms which have been introduced to support the changes to the committal procedure. I'll bring some further slides up now um, so that you can follow those on screen. We can see here that five forms have been introduced, very easy to remember, the N600 through to the N604. And I'd like to say a few things in particular about the N600 form, which is the contempt application. First, and with reference to the matter of permission, the application does include provision for permission applications, and I'll show you how that's done in a second. But secondly, although the form will be used in many cases, it won't be used in all of them, um, owing to the exception for cases which require the Part 8 procedure to be used instead. And what the rules say um, at this, a contempt application in relation to alleged interference with due administration of justice, otherwise than in existing High Court or County Court proceedings, is made by an application to the High Court under Part 8. So, as I say, do be aware that although the form will be used in many cases, um, it isn't to be used in cases where this exception applies. Um, I mentioned that I'd show you how permission applications um, are made with reference to Form N600, and I've circled the relevant text in yellow on the screen there. Um, we can see that it says that if permission is required to make this application, the application for permission, headed application for permission must be included in this application and what that really involves is taking a fresh um, sheet of paper entitled application for permission and um, the points in support of that application would then be set out and the entire thing with the N600 be sent off together. Um, and staying um, for a Further moment with the N600, we can see that the matter of the Part 8 exception um, is also made very clear on the face of the form. And what I've circled there is the title at the very top of the N600, and you can read in the brackets underneath that there's a reminder of the Part 8 exception. So it really can't be missed. And let's turn next to the requirements upon an application. And these are dealt with by Rule 81.4. The rule formalises the case law requirements on the information to be included in a contempt application. An affidavit or affirmation is still needed unless the court directs otherwise. And the rule is um, quite neatly set out. There's a long list of requirements under 81.4 subparagraph 2. And unsurprisingly, um, what's contained under that subparagraph has made its way onto the N600. The idea being that the form will lead you through the requirements under the rule so that nothing is missed out. What I'd say is it's always worth a quick check at the end, um, looking at what you've put on the N600 against the requirements under the subparagraph. And the rule um, before moving on also importantly codifies the defendant's right to remain silent. Um, the defendant can decline, of course, to answer any question which may incriminate him or her. And unsurprisingly, again, um, that matter has also made its way into the text on the N600.
you may be familiar um, that the court has its own procedure for dealing with matters of contempt and the procedure has been codified under rule 81.6. If the court considers that a contempt of court, including one in the face of the court, may have been committed, the court on its own initiative, the rules say, shall consider whether to proceed against the defendant in contempt proceedings. And the way the court would do that is by issuing a summons um, that would normally be served personally. Uh, it can though be served on the defendant's solicitors, um, but only in circumstances where the solicitors do not raise an objection. Um, if they were to raise an objection, they would have seven days in which to do it. Importantly, the rule makes clear that the court does expect any party to give proportionate and reasonable assistance to it if the procedure under Rule 81.6 is engaged. The court can, of course, also issue bench warrants which secure a defendant's attendance. And this is something also now codified under Rule 81.7, subparagraph 2. I'd like to move next to the subject of hearings and judgments, which are found under Rule 81.18. As Desmond was explaining earlier, the 10 new rules introduced under Part 81 have really simplified matters um, a lot. The procedure is much more streamlined um, as a result of the new changes, and, and that is certainly the case in respect to the matter of publicity, since Rule 81 Point eight replaces both a practice direction and also some practice guidance. So it's much tidier than it was. Um, but it hasn't altered the position that the court must continue to notify the media via the press association before hearing all or indeed part of any hearing in private. Although having said that, the um, ability of the court to um, hear a matter in private does not apply at all to judgment, um, that is the court's findings and any punishment, and those matters always have to be heard in public. And perhaps I could end with a couple of recent cases. Inevitably, these are pretty limited as of yet, given the recent nature of the changes. Um, but two cases I'd like to um, uh, talk about are Oliver and Sheik which concerns the court's approach to sanctions. And secondly, the case of Zurich and Barnacoat and another, which deals with the matter of the criminal standard and evidence. Um, turning first then to Oliver and Shake, um, this is perhaps the first time that the new rules have been mentioned in a case. And it's clear that the rules um, do not change the principles relating to sentencing um, following this case. Um, the decision on sanction um, remains entirely for the court. And it's not for a party to seek any particular penalty, only to make submissions on circumstances and consequences. Um, and just as before, the object of sanction is to punish breach, but also to secure future compliance. Worth pausing perhaps um, to have a quick reminder of the sanctions for breach. The court can make no order at all. Um, it can impose an unlimited fine. And it also has the abil ability to um, make imprisonment of up to two years. Um, but that would only apply where the conduct is really so serious that no other penalty is appropriate. I mentioned two recent cases. And the second of those, Zurich and Barnacote and another. Um, this, in fact, is a very recent case, and um, it's only three weeks since um, the judgment. Um, we don't yet know what the defendant's punishment um, is going to be, and um, I believe we're likely to find out sometime next week. Um, in this case, the um, claimants, two of them, um, were found to have been fundamentally dishonest in bringing personal injury claims after they were injured um, by falling down at manhole, and um, by all accounts, um, the uh, two claimants concerned had been out one evening and drunk rather a lot. 
and um, upon the court finding that the injury claims were fundamentally dishonest, the defendant insurer Zurich brought contempt proceedings. Um, and two questions of particular note um, arose. Um, did the accident happen at all? It was suggested by Zurich that there was no accident at all. Um, or was there an accident, but did it just not happen in the manner described? And those questions um, were um, important in this case because they gave rise to um, a question on the court having to be sure um, beyond reasonable doubt upon the evidence before it when um, making its findings in the contempt proceedings. Um, the court was satisfied that the claimants did not suffer any significant form of injury. Um, the court didn't have any difficulty, in fact, in um, coming to that decision. Um, after all, the district judge had um, provided a very long list of inconsistencies by the two claimants concerned and um, upon a thorough analysis of those inconsistencies had dismissed their personal injury claims. However, the district judge had not gone so far as to say that there was no accident at all. And so um, the court in the contempt proceedings had to consider the matter on the evidence um, before it. And the only evidence on that subject was in the affidavit provided by Zurich. And um, that supporting evidence um, was not first-hand evidence um, of the accident itself. The legal executive who provided the evidence um, did not witness the accident and so could not say that there was no accident at all. And as a result of that, the court could not say beyond reasonable doubt that there was no accident at all. And so in many ways, the case um, makes a fairly general point that when making uh, an application, it's important to consider the nature of the evidence upon which um, the party is going to rely and to consider carefully whether it's likely to make out um, the um, contention which is sought. So that's two recent cases and um, that leaves me to say thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Um, do log on to our website as I say 42br.com. You'll find links there to our YouTube channel through to Twitter and LinkedIn and you'll also be able to download the slides which we've taken you through today. If you're watching this broadcast um, as it takes place, I'm going to end this webinar now, um, but stay with us and there'll be an opportunity for some questions. And um, thanks again for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, as I've just said, we're going to take some questions now. And um, Desmond, I've got a first question for you, if you don't mind. Oh, right. Um, do the new rules raise any issues where the defendant has um, capacity issues? Right. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, Peter's been through CPR, he referred to CPR 81.4. Now that's the fourth of the, of the tenth, 10 rules and it's entitled requirements of a contempt application. Um, if you look at, uh, let me just get the rule, it's sub, sub rule two, 81.42 G. Yes, in, in paragraph G, when the application is made, there has to be, as, as we said, in both of our parts, we said there's a requirement that uh, there are a number of statements that are made or information provided to the defendant. Uh, and one of these, and there are quite a few, uh, there must be at least 15, 15 or 20. In, in G, subparagraph G, it states, there must be a statement uh, of confirmation of the claimant's belief, that's the party, the claimant's belief, that the person who gave an undertaking, uh, the person who gave any undertaking understood its terms and the consequences of failure to comply with it. Now, that immediately, that immediately, um, breaks cases down into, into two types of case. I don't think there's any such requirement in relation to injunctions. Uh, so you don't have to say whether the, um, the defendant had capacity in an injunction type case. And, and it, is, it, it is often the case that if there's a, an issue of capacity, you may well not get the undertaking. Maybe you may not have taken it in the first place, but if there is, if an undertaking was given and, and of course, 
we're all familiar uh, in housing practice with defendants whose capacity fluctuates and goes in and out of capacity. It might have been an undertaking given, let us say, a year ago at a time where the defendant, after a certain amount of pressure from the housing services and intensive support then provided by, um, by support teams, the defendant has received some treatment, got onto medication, got into a good position, and then given the undertaking. So that the undertaking at that time was okay, uh, but then subsequently something else has happened and events have occurred which may or may not amount to a breach of that. Well, the party, and it's not the lawyer who's, if a lawyer is involved in um, giving the statement in the application, the, the, it's, the lawyer would need to get instructions from the party as to what the up-to-date position was at the time um, the undertaking was given, not in relation to the time when any breach is as alleged to have occurred. By contrast, of course, if there was an issue as to capacity at the time when the undertaking was given, and that was at that time glossed over, but there was an issue, then I think the party most certainly, uh, you have to take instructions and the party most certainly would have to um, uh, reveal that um, at, at, um, at this stage once uh, contempt is in play. Um, beyond that, um, I don't think there was anything else that uh, springs to mind. Um, no, I don't, I don't think there's any, there would only be the usual issues that arise, uh, generally speaking, if you have clear knowledge that someone has a lack of capacity, then in those circumstances, and there are issues, I think, therefore, more generally, uh, whether you proceed with a contempt application before the court, for example. It might be a discriminatory action. It might be a give rise to a course of action in damages if you if you did something like that and someone's deprived of liberty for a short period of time or, or whatever. No, so so um, no, I've got nothing more to add on that one. Thank you very much for that question. I see you've got another um, question coming in. If I can just uh, flick it up on my system, and the question is, yes, it, I, this, I, this one occurred to me. Do the, um, I think this is best for you, Peter? This one. Um, do the new forms deal with all of the matters that we've just been referring to that, that are required by CPR 81.4? Um, yes, and we've mentioned, Desmond, that the um, ethos behind the new procedure is to make sure that matters are simplified. And um, if you look at the N600, um, you'll see that, in fact, it's been set out in a very simple way, which um, reflects exactly the manner in which Rule 81.4 is being constructed. Um, and that rule really falls into two parts. Um, the first half sets out the um, matters which um, need to be addressed upon making the application. Um, for instance, um, the manner in which it's alleged um, there has been a contempt. And the second part um, deals with the matters which have to be brought to the defendant's attention. And so when you look at the form, um, the relevant um, boxes and panels um, deal first with the um, first part of the matters that need to be set out on the application. And then secondly, there's a freestanding page, which then goes on to deal with everything that needs to be brought to the defendant's attention. So it really reflects the rule. It's very simple. Um, and in fact, the same can also be said in respect of the new summons form as well, which looks very much like the application form. And that's to, in essence, make sure that when the court issues a summons and um, that all the relevant information um, is provided as well. So the uh, the headline there is that it is very much a simplified procedure. Um, thank you. Um, we got a question up there from David Wigel. Thanks, David, for that question. I, I've just lost that question from my system. Uh, Peter more efficiently probably has has logged it or retained it. Did you see that, Peter, when it came up? Um, I've got a couple of come up here, Desmond. Um, I've got one on the use of um, affidavits in the circumstances of self-isolation. Um, will the practical issues of getting an affidavit sworn in a nuisance case by, say, someone self-isolating be justification for serving a statement instead? Well, that's an interesting question, and I'm, I'm not going to give a, a terribly authoritative answer, save to say this. Um, recently down in Croydon County Court, um, I was uh, pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by the a district judge making, uh, giving directions in relation to a committal application following an arrest under Section 9 of the 2014 Act. And, and the district judge took it as read that during the lockdown, or in effect, as a result of either the lockdown or indeed uh, people who are self-isolating, that there should be no requirement for uh, an affidavit 
and that a witness statement would suffice. And I assumed, we didn't go into it in detail, but I assumed that that was a sort of a proactive order uh, by the judge on the basis that affidavits are more difficult to, to, to obtain today. So, so I, think you, I think the answer to that is yes, witness statements, yes, but you need to get an order from the court uh, agreeing to that. I, I think that's right. In essence, it seems to me that you rely relying upon the, the view that a particular judge takes of the matter. Um, you still need to get the court's permission. In reality, though, I think most judges in the circumstances would um, be willing to contemplate um, waiving the need for the affidavit. Um, we'll have to see when the time comes when perhaps that um, relaxation many judges may feel is appropriate starts to wane as um, the situation improves. Um, I'm just going through the questions um, again, and um, we've um, been asked a question about access injunctions. Um, Desmond, you, you might want to pick up on this, it's something you mentioned a, a while ago. Um, the question is, um, do the rules apply to um, a contempt application for breach of an access injunction? Yes, the, the, I'll give you the short answer to that, and that's yes, they do. Um, that's civil contempt, that is your classic um, civil contempt uh, scenario for a housing practitioner. Obviously, the antisocial behaviour injunctions and the committal that follow, the committals that follow from that, they are in the main, uh, the, the vast majority of them. But yes, in, beyond that, as I think I said to start with, on the, on the widest housing management basis, there are things such as gas injunctions, access for works injunctions, and the like. Those are civil, standard civil contempts. They fall squarely within these rules. You do not need to apply for permission uh, to get them. You issue your case in the county court in the usual way. And I think, I think, I it's, think it's fair to say that these rules, these rules don't really change the way, substantially the way in, in, in which you'd go about that and do that. Uh, what one would always recommend it, or did always recommend as best practice under the old rules that were very good detailed laying out of all the particulars of breach as required by the rules. Those are all required under 81.4. And then of course you have the service provision uh, down there as well. Uh, and that you've got these extra items that you've got to include in your application. But beyond that, it's a, it's a, it's, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a tick box exercise, essentially, you've got to make sure you've covered everything. So yes, absolutely. Cast injunctions, entry injunctions, under these rules, yes, they will, they will apply. Desmond, I've got an interesting one here. Um, does the panel consider that the defendant's right to silence extends to an investigation of the claimant of the contempt allegation? In other words, is the claimant permitted to ask the defendant if they did the act alleged before commencing the contempt proceedings? And if so, must the claimant caution the defendant in advance? Um, we had a case recently, the questioner asks, where an anonymous but threatening letter had been sent and the housing officer asked the defendant if he sent it. Um, the rest of it's cut off, but seems to say that the judge ruled um, the question inadmissible. Um, and it seems to me that you can always ask the question, but that um, isn't, um, I'd suggest, going to assist when it comes to the matter of the contempt procedure. Um, and it, it seems to me we, we have the procedure and that's um, what needs to be followed. And in those circumstances, the um, ruling of inadmissibility doesn't strike me as surprising. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, that is, it is a fascinating question. Thank you for, for, for that question. I'll just I'll just start and, and Peter um, Peter may disagree and he may be right to disagree but let me just say what, what occurred to me as 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 um, Peter was talking there. Um, first of all, I couldn't I couldn't uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer the question whether a contempt as such is regarded as the commission of a crime. That, that's the first point. Wh whether this is in nature a crime, a civil contempt is in nature a crime. That's that's an interesting question. So if you were in court and you were questioning a witness, um, if you were in court and questioning a witness, I, I think I'm right in saying that the judge would stop if you asked a question where a person was uh, about to answer a question to, as to whether they committed a crime, Ju judge would certainly step in and say, no, you don't have to answer that. You've got the privilege against self-incrimination. So query therefore within the court proceedings, whether you would be entitled to refuse to an answer about whether you uh, whether you committed a civil contempt, right? That's within court proceed within the court and giving evidence. Does the, Peter, I mean, it's a while since I've st studied the privilege. Is it, it's a it's, it's a privilege against civil uh, self incrimination, isn't it? You're not entitled 
to be asked anything. Is it, uh, I'm just thinking outside court. Have you got any thoughts on that? Because it seems to me the position is different or potentially different. A housing officer could always go and ask, um, you know, did you actually do this? Because you can totally see the, the, the other side of the coin here on this. The housing officer would say, well, the last thing I'm going to do is start embarking on a committal application until I've heard both sides of the story. I want to hear what those and 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 do a proper investigation. It might be derelict of duty of not doing that. I, I personally don't think the question is is in fact. Or, or I say offensive. I don't think it's 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 wrong actually in principle. Um, and once the question has been asked, it's an admission outside court, which can then admit something that the manager of the department, and then if the housing officer on the higher panel, it then becomes hearsay, which would be admissible admission of that. But, but I'd be interested to hear what Peter says about that. I lost the uh, last couple of sentences there, Desmond, but I, I think the point is that um there's clearly dis a distinction between asking a question outside of a court and asking a question within the court. And um, the way I understood the question related to um, a question and asked outside of court proceedings, um, not within the court proceedings. And um, plainly what you said in respect of asking the question in court is right, that the defendant would um, have an undoubted right to refuse to answer a question which might give rise to self-incrimination. Uh, yes, yes, and assume, assuming that that this, let's assume for purposes that falls within that, uh, within the, uh, uh, admitting a commission of a civil contempt amounts to commission of a crime, let's assume that. Just going back to what I was, the last two lines, that I'm, what I was saying was, once a question has been asked by a housing officer, did you do this? If an admission is made by the defendant or the proposed defendant, and the housing officer has heard that, that the housing officer would then be able to give evidence of what is an admission and is hearsay evidence, it's in nature of an admission, and then go into court. Now, I think what the questioner was asking was, well, should the judge have prevented that evidence being given in court? And I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure about that. No, I, th I think that probably is different, isn't it? Because um, the, the questioner outside of the court proceedings um, is able to give evidence, it seems to me, upon the answer that they were received. Um, and I do think that is on balance a difference. Hmm. Well, thank you again for that question. That's an interesting question. We'll, we'll, we'll probably both be willing to have a quick look at that uh, later yeah. on, just to double check on that. And any, any more questions? Um, this is quite an interesting one. Um, what do you do if you want a fast committal hearing? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting one, that, isn't it? Um, I, 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 I got to the end of my, when I, at the end of what I was saying in, in, in the talk, um, I'm not sure I came to a firm conclusion about that. I think that um, if you look at, again, as, as, as in Peter's part of the talk, he talks about 81.4. This, this is probably the first thing that you should go and have a look at, these, these statements of information uh, uh, that have got to be provided in an application for contempt. And um, one of the statements since paragraph 81.2.L is that the defendant is entitled to a reasonable time to prepare for a hearing. Now that's of course the, the general position anyway. And we all know that common sense district judges and circuit judges ensure that a person has reasonable time and the opportunity for legal representation. And they always usually mention the availability of legal aid as well. But this is what good practice in, in the court is all about. But there it is, it's a new requirement. So supposing you're, you've got a very serious matter, some, quite a serious allegation of, uh, let's say an attack on someone, a physical attack on someone, uh, they're arrested by the police, and um, you want to try and bring on a committal for that very quickly, because there's a real threat that it'll occur again if the person is, is released. Uh, and, well, you can obviously bring them before the judge and you can get a short period of, uh, a short period of remand in custody, but it is incredibly short under Schedule 1 of the 2014 Act. Um, not more than eight days. I think it's not more than eight days in total and three days to start with. So it's really not very efficient that. It, 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 I, I certainly remember in the past being pushed by very concerned housing officers on the morning that someone was arrested to actually run the committal hearing in the afternoon. I remember famously, well, I said it's not very famous to anyone else, but famously for me, in front of Judge Welshman. I don't know if anybody knows it's on the Judge Welshman. He used to sit at Lambeth. And he gave me about three signals in the morning that he did not want to do it. He did not think it was appropriate and, and I really shouldn't be pushing him. And he was essentially implying to me that I should go back, tell my client 
that we'll deal with it later in a few weeks' time. But my clients would refuse to take that position. So we had to do it in the afternoon. And of course, as one can then anticipate, the whole thing went completely pear-shaped because the police officer didn't come up to evidence. And the judge was looking at me as if to say, I told you so, when um, eventually the whole thing went, uh, went wrong at the end that we didn't get the committal. And there is a real risk in trying to do it. That's doing it quickly because of the inefficiency of doing it quickly. But the more, more importantly, there's, the, there's the, the prejudice to the defendant's rights. I think unless it's extremely serious, then you always put it off. And if it's extremely serious, the risk of something further happening, then really that's a police matter. And it really should be handed over to the police to take custody of a person who might be at risk of doing something else. I mean, obviously, it's a lot of grey areas here. But um, uh, the main, the, 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 it's, I suppose it's impossible you, in a week, you could get, get you could organize some legal representation. So I'm trying to organize it, help organize it, not pay for it, try to get public funded solicitors to, you know, to sort of make contact with this particular defendant, keep tabs on it. Seven days is tight, but you could do it in theory, but it's a risk. And that's the main thing that you want to avoid because of course the, the courts take any problems of procedure or unfairness very seriously in this context. I don't know if you've had any thoughts arising out of that, Peter. Um, no, I've got a final question to squeeze in um, before we um, come up to the hour and um, bring, a session, bring the session to an end. Um, we're asked, um, when the defendant is arrested, do you believe in the majority of instances that there's a presumption for an adjournment um, to allow for compliance with the spirit of Part 81, e.g. service of either a summons or N600? Well, that's a good question. I think probably, I think the key word there is, is it majority? Is the answer, yeah, I think majority, I mean, it, yeah. The, yeah, the majority, the majority of cases are not serious and urgent. So, they're, they're, I, well, I, obviously there's an injunction, but certainly in my experience, I think probably practitioner, I don't know, you please, you know, it, it, I would have thought that often breaches occur because they, they, there are a wide range of situations where breaches occur going into an exclusion zone around in a neighborhood where you're not supposed to be uh doing an act that not not nest being present some yeah it's the same thing being present somewhere where you shouldn't be there, there are a very broad range of, of types of breaches that people do get arrested for because they shouldn't be doing them but they're not actually doing something that's very seriously uh it, it, it is a serious risk to uh, somebody else's safety or, and the like. So majority of cases, I'd say yes. I think we all would agree that probably. I don't know. Do I think agree? the majority of cases, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, um, we're just at uh, six o'clock now. So um, could I thank you all again for joining us this evening? Um, we hope that you found today's um, webinar useful. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we've got our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to watch this as a recorded event at a later point, if that's helpful. Um, and do also log on to our website and you'll be able to download the slides after tonight. The site is 42br.com. Yes, thank you very much and good night.